Resurrection, that's our topic. So we begin with the idea of the resurrection as event. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11 orients us with this emphasis. Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received in which you also stand, through which you are also being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, whether it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Jesus was resurrected is something that was proclaimed by the earliest churches, by the earliest leaders, by the earliest followers of Jesus, there has never been a point in Christian history in which the resurrection was not part of the mes message. And the resurrection wasn't just something that we say believed in a spiritual sense. The resurrection was proclaimed as being an actual event with witnesses who saw this risen Jesus. So with this idea of the resurrection as an event, what we're really talking about is the resurrection as history. The resurrection is actually something that happened in the course of human events. And really, every question of faith ultimately comes down to this. The question of Jesus walking out of that tomb. If Jesus did not walk out of that tomb, our Christianity is meaningless. Everything we've talked about so far and everything we're going to talk about is a waste of time. If Jesus walked out of that tomb, then everything we've talked about so far and everything we're going to be talking about isn't just part of our faith. It's part of the history of this world, part of the reality of this world. Everything that we've talked about and will talk about is becoming exceedingly vital as a way of interpreting reality itself. Who speaks for God? Who speaks for this world? That's the question the resurrection answers. Was Jesus right or was Jesus wrong? There are certainly some good reasons against saying the resurrection happened. Certainly, even from the very beginning, there were people who didn't believe, and there continued to be people who don't, didn't believe, and continue to be people who believed at one point and then stopped believing because they basically could not conceive of the resurrection as actually happening. The classic one, I mean, really, the, the very modern argument, especially in the last few hundred years, has been the resurrection. Don't be silly. Those things don't happen. So it's ruling out the resurrection simply because resurrections don't happen, and so you can't start a basis of faith with something that can happen, and it's never been something that actually has happened. And so when the early church says it happens, they were trying to talk about it in, in, in terms that didn't mean to imply it was really real, it just was some kind of spiritual event. Because people don't live again. People don't die and become entirely dead and fully dead and then walk out of tombs. That, that doesn't happen. Do you know someone who that has happened to? Neither do I, right? So. Clearly, it can't happen to anyone. Add to that, there's no conclusive evidence that Jesus was resurrected. Now, there's we'll, we'll talk about some indications, but the fact is that it seems if Jesus was dead and rose again, that we would have a lot of testimony from people who weren't in initially followers of Jesus. We'd have outsiders who said, wait a second, we saw this guy die on the cross, now he's walking around. 
we'd find Roman writers or Jewish writers or other people saying, this happened. I don't know what to do with it, but this happened. There's just no evidence that's absolutely conclusive for people who may not already believe in Jesus. And the nature of the resurrection appearances. So that's another suggestion for people who have trouble believing in it, is that the resurrection appearances themselves sure don't seem like a regular guy interacting in a normal way as if he just popped back to life. What do we have with the resurrection appearances? We have Jesus not being recognized by people who knew him extremely well before. We have Jesus popping in and out of rooms and popping in and out of places and seemingly not following the standard rules of physics, and certainly not the standard rules that we're limited by. So the nature of the resurrection appearances sure sound to a lot of people like they were visions, or hallucinations, or some kind of hypnotic suggestion, or simply made-up narratives, because the nature of the resurrection just appearances just sounds a bit too uncertain and strange. There, so there are good reasons against, but there are good reasons for believing in the resurrection. The witnesses. What does a court of law do when the judge or the police officers or whoever has been involved in, in deciding the truth of a matter, they haven't seen it personally? So what do they do to in order to prove something happened or something didn't happen? Well, they call witnesses. They say, are there people here who say they saw this thing? And if the witnesses are good enough and if the witnesses are credible enough, then the witnesses themselves can be bearers of the truth. They can they can conv be convincing statements so that the judgment is said that this actually did happen in the way the witnesses say. So there are witnesses. We do talk about witnesses. The, the passage I just read has Paul listing a number of references and, and, and witnesses. And when he says, the, uh, m most of whom are still alive, what does he mean by that? He's meaning, go talk to him. Jesus appeared to Peter, to Cephas. Go talk to, go talk to him. He appeared to James. Go talk to him. He appeared to 500. Here's a list of names. Here, these are the people Jesus he appeared to. You want to hear more? Talk to these people. He's making a claim that there are witnesses who actually saw this, who could tell their story in a unified way. No conclusive evidence to the contrary. Now, this is an interesting one. We, we had no conclusive evidence for the resurrection, but we don't have any conclusive evidence against. And it's strange because it would have been very easy, it seems, for the early opponents of Christianity to argue that Jesus hadn't been resurrected by simply producing a body, by showing that there were clear signs that this guy had died. The Romans put guards up. The Jewish leaders knew that there, there may have been some interest in the body of Jesus afterwards. So they, they were watching, and yet there was no body. There's no body to be found. There's no testimony at any point from the very beginning that there was a body of Jesus that was found. Again, that's not an absolutely conclusive thing, but it's a good reason because, again, there would have been great reason to produce a body and Christianity would have ended before any of us had even heard of it in the first century. This is the big one for me, historical resonance. Now, what do I mean by that? That's also probably the most confusing one. The others you, you can sort of interpret right off the bat. This one's a little trickier. Historical resonance means that you don't have to know the details of an event to know an event that happened because when something happens, it causes reverberation in what happens next. So, for example, we don't need to know the details about someone like Adolf Hitler in Germany in, in the 1920s and 30s to know a certain leader with certain traits, with certain obsessions, took over and had certain goals because we don't need to know all the details but we sure can piece together the fact that someone like that must have existed because of the nature of what happened in world war ii you have millions and millions and millions of people dying they say up to a hundred million people died over the course of world war ii more specifically you have an entire population of jewish men women and children simply disappearing from the record. They who lived at the beginning of this war were simply not around. And you have family members who lived who said, I have this uncle, this aunt, this mother, this father, and now I don't. You have just this huge narrative from countless witnesses of certain events happening that radically transformed history after the 1940s. So the resurrection can be seen in a similar way, as a significantly much more positive way. You have G this man who claimed to be Jesus. You had many people who claimed to be prophets and messiahs 
and leaders of various kinds in religious ways, and it, especially in Judaism, but in, in does any culture has these people? We have these people now who make these claims to be somewhat great and that there's this new messenger of God. But then you have this issue of most of those times when those people die, their movement dies with them. There's no indication that there's any kind of resonance. They, there, there's no indication that they did something continue that, that brought new power. We don't hear of the cults from that time except in certain historical records, and we don't hear of the kind of cults now where people had some kind of messianic claim. David Koresh comes to mind, or or the people who thought the aliens were coming and so they, they killed themselves in order to prepare themselves. You don't hear of any anything after that, right? And yet, with Jesus, you have this man, this prophet, this teacher, who said he was Messiah, who said he was God, if not directly said he was God, he certainly, through his actions, through his language, was asserting the fact that he was God. And there was, there was very little question for the religious leaders that Jesus was asserting this, which is why they charged him with blasphemy. He made claims for himself indirectly that everyone knew were clear claims of being Messiah and clear claims of equality with God himself. That's what got him in trouble, remember. He accepted worship. People who are just leaders don't accept worship. People who are prophets don't accept worship. We have Paul and others in the, in the New Testament being worshipped because they do miracles and they say, no, 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 don't worship us. Jesus let people worship him. Interesting. And then he died. And then he died, and the claim is that he was resurrected. What happened after that? We don't need a conclusive evidence, some kind of picture or outside writing to say that clearly something radical must have happened because you had this group of Jewish men and women on the borders of the Roman Empire who were following a very unknown leader to the rest of the Roman world. Suddenly, in a very quick amount of time, this group of men and women grew in size, grew in numbers, grew in influence. They became so dangerous to others that they started being singled out and persecuted. Tertullian, in the late 2nd and early 3rd century, would write that Christians were everywhere in the Roman Empire. So w within about 150 years, Christians were absolutely everywhere. That every field, every every occupation had a representative Christian. So Tertullian said, so, so much so if you took the Christians out, society would fall apart. Within about another hundred years or so after that, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire itself. With Constantine's rise and Constantine's status as a Christian, first giving freedom to Christians to practice their religion, and then putting Christianity as the if not official, at least the primary religion of this empire. How did that happen? Something happened after the death of Jesus that made a radical resonance in everything that happened afterwards, causing people who had earlier run away and stayed quiet and were, were asking dumb questions to become these radical people who preached in the streets, who did miracles, who were bold in every way. And not only that, you have the Christianity became the legal religion. You have, from the very first generation, men and women willing to die for the testimony that Jesus was raised again. Would you die for something that you didn't believe? Peter was said to be a witness of the resurrection of Christ. Peter, tradition says, was killed for confessing Jesus as the risen Savior. The witness, the very witnesses Paul is claiming, most of whom were later killed for continuing this confession and not backing off. They were martyred. For the confession that, yes, we saw this risen Christ. That's historical resonance. Something happened that radically changed men and women to becoming a new kind of people that initiated a new kind of movement. Now, was this absolutely conclusively the resurrection? No, we can't say that. But it had to be something absolutely radically important because we don't have other kinds of religions of the time having the same kind of influence and impact. In fact, all the other religions of the time, except for Judaism, in this area are gone. Something radically happened. Was the resurrection historical? Now I have historical in quotes because there's a couple different ways of approaching this and it's important to understand history in, a, in these separate, separate ways. History for us is a pattern of events in which one thing happens after another, in which one event causes another event, which causes a third event, which causes a fourth event. That's what we call determinative history in that it's the pattern of the world as the past leads into the present and leads into the future. The resurrection wasn't determinative. We don't say that someone who dies on a cross would necessarily, by 
this the nature of things and the nature of events rise again. Killing someone means they're dead. Determinative history says when you kill someone, they stay dead. But it was eschatological history. It was God breaking into this world and doing a radically new thing. Doing something and initiating something that had no bearing on anything on the past, but initiated this new work purely within his own power of establishing a history within history. Now, the tricky and important part here is to, is it, it would be easy to say determinative history is what really happened and eschatological history is sort of the religious claims of what happened. Well, that's not exactly true. Determinative history did not create the world, but the world exists, right? There was nothing we would say that determined that this, this world came into being on its own. And whether you believe in a testimony of science of the Big Bang, of evolution, none of that, none of that comes in, into place here because this goes back to the very core testimony of the Christian faith, that we say nothing happened without cause. And this goes to the very essence of science itself. Nothing happens without cause. Even si scientists and Christians are agreed on this. And Christian scientists are especially agreed on this, right? Those who are not Christian are agreed on this. Things don't happen without a reason. There's no reason the world came into being, yet it came into being. We say that however he did it, however he did it, whether it was with this initial act that matches with what science sees as initial, this initial act, whether it was through something else, we say that God spoke the world into being. God broke into and created our very reality out of the eschatological history. God from his space outside of time created time and space. The creation itself was eschatological history that led into determinative history. And the world exists, right? We would say the world is real. So is eschatological history real, true history. It's just not the kind of history that we would expect, not the kind of history that would be determined by the textbooks or stories of the past. It was God breaking into this world in the same way he created this world, doing a new thing. It happened in our experience of time, but it should not be understood as exhibiting yet another event in our experience of time. It's not just something that happened. It wasn't even just a miracle. It was God doing a radically new thing, bringing not only a new event, but bringing a whole new history to bear. So that in eschatological history, the past doesn't influence the present, which then influences the future. It goes the other way. The future, the future of God in which the story and fullness of God is fully revealed and fully known, that is what defines the past and is the future that defines the present. So the event of Jesus' resurrection is an event of the future that breaks into the present. The resurrection is God breaking into what we should expect to do, what we should expect to do something new. So instead of Jesus staying dead, God does something new. And this new work confronts all of our assumptions because dead people stay dead and Jesus did not stay dead. And unlike even the people who have been revived from death, like someone like Lazarus or others, they eventually died again, right? So that was a breaking into the determinative history, did, and yet it just it sort of hit a reset button on a death, but they continue to live and continue to die. This new work of the resurrection confronts all our assumptions because we say Jesus has never died since. The resurrection was entire and total. This new life is a new life that continues even now. Everything changes. Our whole assumption of, that the past defines the present and the present defines the future can no longer be assumed as defining reality. The resurrection breaks into what we should expect, and God does something new. And so everything that we assume should happen, that we should that should we should expect, is now confronted by the idea that God can do whatever God wants to do. So eschatology, the study of the end times, the study of the fullness of God. Eschatology is sort of usually what we talk about when we talk about the story of Revelation or some of the prophecies of Daniel, these the story of where God is going to be fully revealed. Well, that doesn't wait for the second coming or some other event later on. The future has already interacted with the present, and that in first interaction was at the resurrection. And this resurrection then defines this fullness of the end times, the last days, the fullness of God's glory being revealed began on that Easter morning, that first Easter morning, and has continued to be a defining reality within the history of this world. So the resurrection is a promise. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. 
For the dead are not raised, and Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The resurrection is a promise. The resurrection is more than an event that something happened. The resurrection points to a whole new work of God. And if the, res the promised resurrection where Jesus says, if you destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days, Jesus was saying the resurrection is a promise. If it didn't happen, God doesn't meet his promises. Jesus wasn't right about God's promises. If it did happen, then the promise of Jesus to be resurrected was initiated. And the promise of everything that comes with the teaching and call of Jesus continues. And so the resurrection as this event speaks into this full work of God in which God says he will do this thing, and he did it. Just as God said to the people of Israel, I am going to free you from Egypt and bring you into a new land, he did it. So God says that to us. I am going to free you from Egypt. I am going to free you from death. I am going to free you from sin, and I am going to bring you into a new land. If Christ was not resurrected, we are not freed from death. We are not freed from sin. We are not freed to go into a new place of living. But the testimony of Christianity from the very beginning was that the resurrection is a promise that was fulfilled in the event of Jesus and continues to be a promise that is being fulfilled in the course of our lives into the end of things. So the resurrection is this promise that initiates. It wasn't, the promise wasn't finished with Jesus. The promise, we can say, began with Jesus. The beginning of its initiation was with the resurrection on that first Easter morning. Because, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then it is coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power. The resurrection begins. All will be made alive in Christ. That is the promise. Christ has been raised from the dead. That's the fact. That's the event. Begins this process. Christ was raised from the dead. Then those who belong to Christ. Then all of things will be handed over to God by Christ. God the Father. Notice the language there. The Trinitarian language. So there's something new that starts. Something that new that starts. Begins with Jesus. Then expands to include his followers. To everyone. To all of creation. And all of this fulfills the promise that we see Jesus con initiating in his ministry and in his trial. We see Jesus confronting the rulers and authorities in power, the religious leaders, the Roman rulers, the zealots, that led to the cross and to his suffering. We see Jesus confronting death and hell in the descent. The fullness of the resurrection says Jesus will over not only confront those, Jesus will be shown as the winner, the victor, and this new beginning initiates the fullness of God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So the resurrection is a new beginning. It starts a new story in humanity and in this world. And as I just mentioned, this confrontation is one that the resurrection shows who speaks for God, who speaks for this world. For Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put into subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who put all things in sub subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be God, all in all. Who speaks for God? Who speaks for this world? All things are going to be subjected to Jesus, to the Son. So who was right in the trials? Was Jesus or were the various leaders? Who was right? Who has ultimate power in death? Jesus or hell and death. The resurrection is a testimony of Jesus' authority that he was who he said he was. That he will do what he will said he will do. That in confronting the people who thought they'd won, Jesus showed himself to be the absolute winner. Jesus is in charge. Jesus is the victor. Jesus has conquered sin and death. Every authority and every power. That's from 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 28. And notice throughout these last few sections that I've just been going through that passage. 1 Corinthians 15, read it for yourself. Ponder it, look over it. This is the testimony of the Christian church. 1 Corinthians is considered by many, if not to, it's not considered the earliest of, of the New Testament written, but it's pretty early. And every scholar, whether liberal or conservative, 
says that First Corinthians really is a genuine letter of Paul, that this is, this is a valid testimony of the earliest Christian church. The resurrection was part of the testimony of the earliest church from the beginning, with all these theological elements included with it. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. Jesus was the Son, the Son to the Father, and as we see in other parts of Corinthians, the Son with the Spirit, with the Father as God. The resurrection shows it's true. So the summary so far, what do we have? The resurrection is a promise. God says he will do something, then he does it. The resurrection is a new beginning. It's a new way of starting. It's a new hope. It That which was determined in the past no longer determines, but what now determines history and reality is God's work in initiating a new thing. Jesus has authority over all things with the resurrection. We don't see this in full. We wait to, for the fullness of glory for this to be revealed. But we say that Jesus is in charge. Jesus, in his resurrection, validated every confrontation, showed himself to be the one who can do what he says he will do, that his words were shown to be true. Jesus is in charge. And this authority is shown to go through what we see throughout the Gospels. His teachings, his interactions with people, give a model for the kind of authority that Jesus is. And this is authority that brings transformation, not domination. This is authority that brings resurrection as confrontation. Jesus doesn't need to say, I am God, I am Messiah, listen to me. That's what people who claim to be God say. That's what people who claim to be Messiah say. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. The resurrection was Jesus saying, I am who I am. I am he, Jesus said at the trial. I am. And how does Jesus lead and express this authority through transforming lives and inviting people who are outsiders? He doesn't have to prove himself. He doesn't have to establish himself as king or emperor through worldly methods or through currying favor, favor with worldly powers. Jesus transforms from beneath and from within taking the least of these, the poor in spirit, the poor in heart, the broken, the battered, the outcast. And these are the people, he says, these are my people. These are the representatives of the kingdom because I suffered with them. I am among the forsaken and outcasts, and I bring the outcast and forsaken into my future. Who are you going to believe? The man who says he is God or the man who speaks in the language of God and accepts worship and then dies? but doesn't stay dead. The resurrection was the con ultimate confrontation to show Jesus was right. Who was right and who was wrong. The story of the resurrection continues. The resurrection leads into an understanding of God's glory. 1 Corinthians 15 continues, but some will ask how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body that is he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. Indeed, stars differ from star and glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spirit that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as the man of heaven, so are those of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. Just as Jesus lived this life and yet returned not according to the rules of other people. He could be touched, he could be felt, he could probably be smelled, and yet he wasn't limited by the rules. Remember that was one of the reasons people say the resurrection could be argued against. But Paul here confronts that statement saying, of course the, this new reality isn't the same as the old reality. Jesus wasn't just reanimated. Jesus wasn't just revived. Jesus was resurrected into a new reality. There was a new beginning here and a new kind of form and a new kind of humanity. One that is embodied, but that takes on the character of a more eternal nature. That is glory. That glory, we can say, is the image of humanity being restored in Jesus. Jesus is the new Adam. That which was lost in Adam becomes restored in Jesus. Jesus was not only fully human, 
he was really the only fully human. Jesus was the one that expresses what humanity is promised to be. And we also have the image of divinity restored in Jesus. Now this is an interesting one. We don't say that God has been lost or God was sinful or God had been broken the same way humanity. How does God need to be restored? Well, let's go back again to the earliest testimonies of scripture. Adam and Eve had a relationship with God. After they ate the fruit, they didn't see God the same way. They were fearful. They were scared. Then they were outcast. Cain, when he kills Abel, no longer sees God as someone to trust, but someone to lie to, or someone to hide from. God was no longer seen as a companion or a friend, but as a judge, as someone to be scared of, as someone to be put in a secret room and hidden, shy away from, and, and see as a stern and dangerous God. In Jesus, that changes. When we think of God in light of the work of Jesus, we don't think of the stern and distant God who is at a moment's known as willing to smite and kick out an outcast. We look, the image of God we, we see in Jesus becomes that which what God truly is. The relationship that God has always intended with humanity, that humanity in its sin had lost. We were afraid of God because we were destined for death and had violated so much of what God requires of us. With Jesus, we are no longer destined for death, so we can enter into a new relationship with God and see God in a new way, a hopeful way, an empowering way, a welcoming way. Instead of Jesus kicking people out of the garden, Jesus, the new Adam, welcomes people back into the garden. The angels are no longer barriers. The angels beckon people saying, come, come and enter into this gate. For Jesus is the welcoming God, the representative of the welcoming Father, who sends the welcoming spirit, who invites all of us to see and interact with God in a new way. So our humanity is restored in Jesus. We become new people. We become able to walk in the way that God intends us, us to walk. We become who we truly can be, who we are truly made to be, no longer broken by sin or evil or problems. We become whole people, just as Jesus was a whole person. The first whole person allows us to be free. This is Romans 8. We are free to live as we are, we are able to live. We are no longer burdened by false identities. We are no longer have to be driven into sin and ruin ourselves and corrupt ourselves and cause chaos. We can be people who bring peace and shalom, who bring hope and light, who resonate this story and narrative so that other people have hope and light. And our participation with God is restored in Jesus. This new image of God, we say, invites us to join with this new image of God and invites us to join with others in this full celebration of love of God and love of neighbor. So we participate with others, with men and women and children all over the world, all throughout time, and participate with this God who now invites us and through the work of Jesus, not only is willing to put up with us, but sees us as heirs, welcomes us into a new relationship that will last into eternity. Everything changes with the resurrection. Moltmann, Jürgen Moltmann notes three dimensions of response that's shown by these first witnesses of Christ's resurrection. Now these are important because these show that the resurrection wasn't simply an event for the earliest Christian, but that there were elements of this that had three dimensions that shaped understanding and that shaped what do we do with this? And that's the question of theology in the Christian life. Not only what happened and what do we believe, but what do we do with it? How do we feel about it? Orthodoxy, orthopraxy, and orthopathy. Right beliefs, right actions, and right feelings, right? Three dimensions of response that were shown by the witnesses of Christ's resurrection. First, the people interpreted Jesus as a coming one of God, a testimony to God's glory and redemption. This is a perspective dimension. They understood and interpreted Jesus in a new way. Second, they recognized Jesus as the one who had suffered and died, who had lived among them and broke bread with them. This is the retrospective dimension. So the resurrection transformed how the people saw Jesus in his future and in the present, but it also transformed how they looked upon the stories of the past. Everything that Jesus said and did was interpreted in a new light because it was seen that these weren't just, you know, stories of a good teacher. This was God himself. If you spend three years with someone and then you find out, oh, this turned out to be God, you'll go through every conversation and every event and every action. You will rack your brain for memories of, oh, that's what that meant. Oh, that was really meaningful. It takes on a whole new dimension. Third, the resurrection caused the people towards understanding their role as witnesses a role of testifying to the work of God being sent out into their particular context. So they knew Jesus was the one, the coming one of God, a testimony of, of God's glory. They knew that was Jesus's future. And they could look back on the teachings of the past and say how these things 
help interpret understanding God, how these things point to to the way Jesus wanted them to live. And this third way is them actually going out and living it, them telling the story. This is the reflexive dimension, the reflex. What do you do when a great event happens? You respond. If someone, if they, if you hit your someone's knee with, with a little hammer, you know, you have a reflex action. So too, if you meet God, it initiates this response. This interpreted response that's based on the interactions of the past and present cause people to live in a new way. And that's exactly what the disciples did. This resurrection, this moment, caused them to look upon the past in a new way. It caused them to realize the future had now a new beginning, this new testimony of God and God's glory. And that meant they do otherwise. They were living in a new way. They were being sent out. They were compelled to be witnesses to this reality. Overall, the experiences of witnessing the risen Christ awakened in those who experienced them an expectation which was highly tense and which embraced the whole world. Highly tense because everything had changed and a new beginning had started and you can't live life in the same way and you don't know now what God's going to do next. Which is, that's the fun part of the book of Acts. You see this tension all throughout is the early church is given the spirit and they go out in the streets preaching, but it seems that time and time again, God keeps popping up and calling them to do these new things that they don't know how to do. And yet God calls them to do it and empowers them to do it. You have the whole story of Cornelius being part of the Gentiles inclusion. You have the story of the, the gift of tongues and the way of community that extended out into the whole world. It was a transformative experience. Everything changed. These people not only said, oh, we have to go out and do these new things. These people became a new kind of people who just did these things. It wasn't that they had to do works, it's that they were people who just lived in a radically new way because of the work of God in them. And because of the work of God in them that led them to live in a new way, they radically impacted their communities, their context. The way that the Spirit formed them became transformative as it went out among them and beyond them, transforming whole settings, whole contexts, eventually the whole Roman Empire and the whole world. This means that what we can know historically about Christ's resurrection must not be abstracted from the questions, what can we hope from it? And what must we do? Christ's event says, what does this hope mean? What can we hope? For? And it challenges us. It doesn't just leave us. What must we do? If this new reality is true, and if this new reality has brought a dawn of a new transformed life empowered by the Spirit, what does this mean for us? So the resurrection of Christ is historically understood. This event, this actual event that actually happened that resonated into this world can only be understood in a full sense in the unity of knowing, hoping, and doing. We know it happened and this knowing brings a new hope and this new hope brings a new reality that calls us and empowers us to do things in light of it. And all these things, this knowing, this hoping, this doing, this transformative life leads to a new approach to life, an approach radically different than others in this world. And sad to say, radically different than even a lot of people who might claim to be Christian, who don't encounter the resurrection in the pattern of knowing, hoping, and doing. What is this new approach to life? Our love for life exceeds our fear of death. Life is everlasting. The life that has been initiated in Jesus is everlasting. We are defined by people of love and we are defined by people who celebrate life. So instead of responding out of a fear of death that leads to competition or domination or anxiety that causes us to hoard and distance and isolate, that causes us to always be on the lookout for problems that will arise and people who might get in our way, that always leads us to look for the signs of the end of the world or the signs of the coming disaster or the signs of some coming terror or some coming event. Those testify to the fear of death. Even if they are given Christian terms, they're a fear of death that has nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ is the love of life. And so we look for signs of life. We look for signs of hope. We look for signs of God's coming kingdom. We look with expectation for what God is doing, not with fear about what other people or other authorities are, are doing. Jesus has already confronted and overcome those things. We don't have to be afraid. So we can love life. We can love others with an openness, with a freedom, with an, a radical inclusion, with a radical celebration of God's continuing work. That's the picture of this feast here. This is the feast that was given when Jesus met the, the disciples on the road. They said, he, they were walking away after the crucifixion and they said Jesus had died. And this guy came up to them and said, what, what are you talking about? And so they told the story of Jesus dying on the cross. And this guy who was walking with them said, don't you know that this is what was fulfilled? 
And he goes through the prophets and the testimony and says, this is, this is what was intending to happen. And they get to this, they, they're, they're fascinated by this guy. And so they say, will you come and join us for dinner? And so they invite him in. This is a, this is a picture of that feast where the, the two travelers invite Jesus in. And Jesus is telling of the, of the promised work of God, this mission of God that led into the crucifixion. And he broke the bread. And they realized this wasn't just a man. This was Jesus himself. The, the man who they said had crucified was the one eating with them. The man they, who they saw suffer and die was the one who was teaching them of the meaning of the crucifixion and thus showing them the meaning of, and truth of the resurrection. Love, hope, promise, knowing, hoping, doing. <coughs> a love of life exceeds our fear of death because of the Jesus who conquered death and now lives. For us, we can see the resurrection as expectation. Pressing on in our look at 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes in 50 through 57, What I am saying, brothers, is this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this, Im when this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is an expectation. With Jesus, we see the resurrection as being an established fact. It's a reality in his experience of the world. Jesus walked out of that tomb on Easter Sunday. And so we say, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Well, most of us know very well where the sting of death is. And we know, especially if we've had loved ones who die, that death seems to sure have victory still. Death seems to swallow up victory. Death swallows up lives. Sin still stings. And so the resurrection for us isn't necessarily this present experience. It's an expectation that what was, what was initiated in Jesus, the reality of the resurrection that was initiated with Jesus, is the true reality, which we continue to expect. We continue to see as the new way of life. Even if our present life doesn't always reflect this now. We know that this is the path, this is the way, this is the what God is doing in bringing transformation to this world. So we expect the resurrection. This orients life within a horizon of expectation. God's people become oriented within the process of his eschatological work. Again, I'm using the word eschatological a lot here, somewhat purposefully, because I'm trying to get into your heads. I, I want you to think again, as of eschatology as being more than something about the end times or the last things. God's eschatological work is his work in the fullness of God's own experience of reality. God is outside time. So our future isn't God's future. Our future is just looking forward to what God is already experiencing. And so when we talk about the eschatological work of God, we're talking about God's fullness of will, God's fullness of kingdom being expressed in all places. And so we become oriented within what is already true for God. We become oriented within the ideal of his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. We become people who live in light of his will, in light of the expectation that God is going to bring in full that which he has initiated. Even as we continue to experience the contradictions of determinative history in our context, we do not live in another world. We're not blind. We don't say, oh, death it doesn't happen. There's no pain. There's no suffering. Just believe. No. We fully acknowledge the fact that there are contradictions in this experience of life in which the past still seeks to define the present and the present still seeks to define the future. We say that God's reality defines the past and the present and our future. But these are two confrontive forces. Just like Jesus confronted the Rome and confronted the religious leaders, so too does the this one kind of history, this determinative history, confront and try to push back the eschatological history. We say God's reality is going to win, but that we're caught up in this confrontation still. And in the confrontation, 
we're experiencing a war. We're experiencing the battle. We're in the middle of these forces that are trying to give each person a new definition and, and, and try to capture each side. So we don't live in another world, but we keep our experience of reality as one in which we're pulled from two different directions. God's pulling us from the future to live in expectation, to live in hope, to live in light of the resurrection. The past and determinative history is pulling us back into the past, trying to be defined by our, by our past, by our context, by our histories, being defined by what has been done, what has been seen to be true in the past, as opposed to what we know is possible and has shown to be true with God. But the, So the hope in the transformative work of God allows us to live within this word of promise, which gives meaning to our participation and our context. If we live in hope that our identity is in God, that God is going to bring fullness to us and bring meaning to us and bring purpose and resurrection to us, we will live in a different way in every part of our lives. We no longer have to compete or dominate or control or hoard or do all these other things in order to gather up so that we might be seen as someone great in light of contemporary forms of identity and meaning. We don't have to live like that. So we can be open and free with other people. We can participate with other people. We can live in a community with other people because we're no longer defining ourselves over and against them. We're defining ourselves <coughs> in light of what God is doing, what God has done, and what God will do. So our participation in our context gives this fuller purpose because we want to be people who live in light of the resurrection even now live in light of this transformative power even now, be people who give other people hope, who participate with people so that they experience the promise even now. So we are alive in Christ. That is the testimony of the resurrection. Even if we're not yet experiencing the fullness of eternal life, even if we're still battered and beaten and broken, even if we're still getting hit by the storms, we say we are alive in Christ because Christ is alive. And in joining with Christ, we join with Christ's future. So our experience is not determined by our past. Our, determined, our experience is determined by Jesus. So we are alive in Christ and we await the full experience of this reality. So this expectation is not in vain. In, keep, in keeping with God's creative <coughs> interaction and commitment, it's a commitment that seeks complete correspondence with heaven and earth. Again, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the call of the resurrection life. The ultimate reality is that God will be fully revealed to this whole world, to all of time and space, so that God's will is done on earth even as it is in heaven. Our calling in light of the resurrection is to be people who do God's will on earth as it is done in heaven, to be obedient like Jesus was obedient. And in this obedience, be a transformative presence that gives the promise of God's will. God's will is not harsh. God's will is not heavy. God's will is not defeating. We read in Romans 8 that God's work is freeing. God's work is enlivening. God's work awakens people to new possibilities and, and new, new ways of gathering together in hope. So the will of God that is done on earth is our calling even now. To be people who correspond to God's will in full. That is the resurrected life. You see, again, this goes back to the idea of the new birth. When we grow up and defined by our past, we're so caught up in old ways of living and old forms of identity that with cross, we're told we have to, we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to those forms of identity. We have to die to those, trying to establish ourselves in those kinds of meaning. And we have to be reborn. The resurrection is this rebirth. And in being born again, we are, in a sense, given new life. Our, our new identity has been resurrected. A new way of living has been resurrected even now, so that as we participate with Christ, we can begin to experience what it means to participate with Christ in eternity. So the resurrection is a historical hope for the future, a hope that is concerned with the future in the lives lived by those who belong to the past. Who belongs to the past? Well, we all belong to the past. We're shaped by the past, we're formed by the past, our own past, our own memories, our own decisions, our families, our friends, our choices, the events in our life. We're also formed by this broader past, the past of our whatever culture we were in, whatever country we belong to. We're formed by these past events that try to shape us. 
But we say our hope isn't somehow in the past. The resurrection is saying that we have a historical hope that what God has done in transforming this reality is a hope for the future, a hope in which God breaks into our experience of history with his history. So the resurrection is not a spiritualized hope, some kind of vague embrace of otherness that f imbues people, fills them with a sense of security in the midst of transitory and unfortunate reality. We're not, in other words, the resurrection isn't the waiting for the pie in the sky, isn't waiting for the great beyond, isn't just about saying, well, life is terrible now, but in the great by and by, when we go to heaven, we'll, we'll find redemption and, and hope. No, there's something more to the resurrection than that. It is a testimony of ultimate reality that we will share eternity with God. But that's not just something that we wait to the end of our life to experience. Christ lives. Christ did not get resurrected purely as a spiritual idea or a spiritualized entity. People were able to touch Jesus. People were able to hear Jesus, to see Jesus, assumingly even smell Jesus. It's a bodily resurrection that orients the work of God towards a physicalized salvation. What God does in resurrection is really a transformative part of our life even now, in this present experience of living. The experience of the risen Christ then points towards a process of transition, one that's oriented eschatologically, an experience within its, with its encounter with our history. So we're, again, in a process of transition. We're oriented in light of God's ultimate reality, even as we experience this reality of time and space that we're in now. Even as we belong to the past, we're being oriented in a new way. We're being transformed. We're being shown how to live as eternal people. You can't do that at all at once, mind you. We don't know what that experience is. And so this life becomes a life of transition in which even now we begin to taste. Even now we begin to take on the attitudes. Even now we, we become more and more obedient to the will of God in a dynamic way. And this obedience, as I said before, is not this harsh law. It's not this constricting lifestyle. The process of transition in this life, it's a dance. It's a dance with God in which we learn the steps, in which we learn the moves, in which we learn how to hear the music and, and let our muscles and minds and all our being take these steps into so it becomes more and more instinctive and more and more part of just how we live. And when we finally see God at whatever point we finally see God in full, we will just naturally be the kind of people who relate in the way that God wants us to relate eternally. 1 Corinthians 15 continues in two parts. The resurrection as transformation. And why are we putting ourselves in danger every hour? I die every day, Paul writes. That is as certain brothers and sisters as my boasting of you, a boast that I make in Christ Jesus our Lord. If with merely human hopes I fought with wild animals at Ephesus, what would I have gained by it? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Come to a sober and right mind and sin no more, for some people have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So what does the resurrection mean for us? It means everything. Paul is willing to put himself in danger. Paul is willing to die every day. Paul is willing to endure the sufferings that he endured because he knows that the Roman rule and his persecutors do no longer no longer define reality. The resurrection defines reality. And if you live in light of the resurrection, all the suffering and all the frustrations that happen as you live a life confronting other false forms of identity, all of that becomes unimportant next to the glory and peace and life of living life with Christ. So Paul can even say, come to a sober and right mind and sin no more. Why? How can Paul say that? Not because you need to prove something to God, not because you are trying to earn your salvation, not because you're, you have to show that you have your own strength so that God will finally accept you? No. God has already done the work. The resurrection is the work of God reaching out to humanity. It's because God has already worked that we are invited to participate in the life that reflects this new power. Because we have already experienced, in part, this resurrection of Christ, we are invited to live in a way that expresses in full that this is the truth and the power of life eternally. So we're called to be steadfast, immovable, always excelling. Because the resurrection 
is a defining reality, we are called to live in a transformed way in light of that reality. We are called to live in ways that say, in our very actions, in our very assumptions, in our priorities, what Jesus did is absolute truth. We are no longer going to be defined by false forms of identity or defined by the past or define others by the past or false forms of identity. We become transformed people because Jesus himself was transformed into this new way of life. And in being transformed ourselves, we invite others into this transformation. This is a way of life, a way of life that follows Jesus in light of the resurrection, even as we're not fully experiencing the fullness of this resurrection even now. So what is the guiding orientation for such work of the Lord? We're always we're to always excel in the work of the Lord in light of the resurrection. But what is the guiding orientation? Love. Love is the orientation of the resurrection. The resurrection leads life to be expressed in love, and it is this life of love that will be that will rise and be transfigured. Such love is oriented by the Spirit and it leads to the way towards the fullness of life that is expressed. In light of the resurrection, in light of the new form of identity and meaning and empowerment that comes in that, we can truly be people who love God. We can truly be people who love our neighbors as ourselves. Why? Because in light of the resurrection, we know that we don't have to define ourselves over against God or over and against other people. We don't have to try to acquire for ourselves our own identity through whatever means possible that human history has shown people have tried to acquire meaning wealth power relationships we don't have to define ourselves in those terms and in not having to define ourselves in those terms we become open to other people people who may not have something to offer us we can still love people who won't help us gain more power and money, we can still love. God is no longer a restricting force who's trying to prevent us from getting all the stuff we want. God is this freeing reality in which we, in relationship with him, can be free to be who we are in peace and love and joy, all the fruit of the Spirit. So in this, in such love, we are opened up to others. We are no longer closed off or restrictive or have to protect our, our, our fragile egos. We're open up to others who may hurt us, who will hurt us. But because we're not defined by such people or such hurts, because we know that there is no hurt that can overcome the power of the resurrection, we can be hurt in light of still remaining a transformative presence. If we close ourselves off out of fear of being hurt, then we're living in light of the past. We're living in light of determinative history. We're not living in light of the resurrection, which frees us. The resurrection, this life of love, this fullness of life steers us. So again, it's a dance. It orients us in certain directions. It makes us attuned to this world in new ways so that we become people who participate with others as Jesus participated with others in his life. This isn't a set rules and established framework. This is a dynamic interaction in which God calls us to be a certain kind of people who just are in the right place at the right time, say the right words when they need to be said, become people who live in light of God's ultimate reality in all of our interactions and in all of our movements and all parts of our life are echo this. And this fullness of life does in fact limit us in some ways. If we're living a life that is oriented totally towards God's reality, in whatever we do, whatever career we pursue, in whatever relationships we have, there are things in which God is going to say, no, we cannot do that. Even if others may find freedom in doing certain things, God will say, this isn't for you because I have something more for you. Or I have something different. Or this thing is going to cut, will undermine your, your understanding of me or your neighbor. And so don't do that. And so... God, in his steering, opens us up into new directions so that we're open to others. But God also, in his steering, limits us from going certain directions, puts up walls, puts up doors so that we don't fall down and go the wrong way. And the closer we are to God, the more God, I think, is orients us towards a specific direction. And sometimes, if we're not entirely mature, we get mad and angry at God because of his limiting work, because of the walls and doors. But if we can see these as a way of God awakening in us who we're truly supposed to be and preventing us from going down wrong directions, it itself is a freeing reality. So the resurrection makes what is not present or even seemingly possible come into being. The resurrection awakens new life. The resurrection is a new creation, a creation, a recreation from nothing, we can say. God does not 
require that we are that we bring to him the right person or the right actions. God says, just come to me. God doesn't want what we do. God wants who we are. God wants us to be, not to do. And if we're, we are the right people in light of God's work, if we let go false forms of identity, then we can be people who participate with God in bringing these new realities into being as well in whatever context. God's work is to make what is not present or seemingly possible come into being. Jesus was dead. That's the end of the story. Then Jesus walked out of the tomb. That's not possible. And yet it is what happened. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Some themes that arise from the resurrection discussion. The new way of living that is initiated by Christ is the anticipated rebirth of the whole cosmos. Remember John 3.16, For God so loved the whole world that he sent his only Son. And when we say the whole world, the Greek there is cosmos. The anticipated, so in, in sending his Son, it's the whole world that God loves, the whole cosmos. And in the resurrection, we say is not just a hope for humanity, it's a hope for all reality. So all of creation groans, Romans 8.18-25. 8, all of creation is groaning for the salvation, and in the resurrection we say this salvation is initiated. The energies of the Spirit are the power of the resurrection among us. The Spirit works. The Spirit is the presence of God in, with, and for us. In participating with the Spirit, we don't lose our identity. We don't become somehow pulled into God's identity. We don't become God. But in the energies of the Spirit, we are awakened to a new reality in which we can commune with God in an open and free way. We can, in the power of the Spirit, become alive in a new way. And this promise of the Spirit, this energy of the Spirit promises us that even if we experience death in this life, that death will not itself be the final story. We are being remade to participate with God. A life lived without expression of this resurrection is a life that is devoid of the horizon of expectation that includes the resurrection of Christ. Are you saved? Are you saved is reflected in how you live. If you are truly reborn with Christ, if you are truly being remade, then your life expresses this life of resurrection, hope, and anticipation even now. If you're living a life of fear and anxiety, you're not expressing the horizon of expectation. And that's not to say that you're not saved. That's to say that you're not taking advantage of the life of salvation that Jesus has worked you don't understand your salvation. We see this throughout the letters of Paul, where Paul says, this is the work of Christ among you. This is the work that God is doing. This is the work of the Spirit. Stop acting like everyone else in the world. You don't have to live like that anymore. There is a new way of life, and this new way of life is full of hope and peace and love and joy. That is the life of the expression of the resurrection, not fear, not anxiety not worry, not concern. Live a life that is free in hope of what God has already initiated, so that in living this way, you will become a participant even now of awakening this life in others, and continuing to find this life being revealed in all kinds of ways in your own life. This participation and this expression starts now. This is the way the resurrection calls us to live even now. This is the way that the early church was awakened in Acts 2 to live right then, this is the way that we see the church responding throughout the New Testament, throughout the early church. There's this new way of life and hope and expectation, even as a lot of the world was arrayed against them. There was this joy. Well, what about us? We live in a pretty comfortable society. There are some conflicts and disagreements about Christianity, but for the most part, Christianity is still the favored religion of our culture. Well, why excuse do we have? To live in a way that is full of fear and anxiety and concern. What reason do we have? What reality do we think is truth? If we think God has truly worked in our lives and the resurrection is true reality, we will live in one way. If we are living in fear and anxiety and caught up in all sorts of concerns about establishing our identity, then whether we say it or not, we really don't believe in the resurrection. And if we say we believe in the resurrection, live like it because the Spirit has empowered us to live like it even now. The resurrection is new creation. In the light of the resurrection, the promise of God extends to humanity and to the whole world. And this is a promise of renewal and new life. This horizon of expectation isn't just for us alone. It bonds us with the whole of creation. And as we are bonding through a shared hope, rather than competing for dominance or competing for the best strategy to address the fate of the world, our hope is in the work of God. Our participation is in the work of God. 
And so we are bonded with the whole of creation because that's where we say the whole work of God is taking place. If we participate in the work of God and the mission of God, then we are bonded with wherever this mission of God is being oriented and with whomever this mission of God is being directed to. Human beings cannot redeem nature, we say, and nature cannot redeem human beings. If we think we are going to be the answer to nature, we're putting ourselves in the place of God. If we think nature is going to be our salvation, we're putting nature in the place of God. Nature is not our hope, and we are not the hope for nature. And if we try to frame ourselves around either of these hopes, explicitly or implicitly, communities will fracture and divide and will break apart. Such hopes assert an insufficient hope and an insufficient identity for the world. Only the resurrection brings real hope for humanity and for the whole world, as the power of life itself is engaged in the renewal of all creation. Again, God is the hope for all creation. The power of the resurrection is the power of hope for, the, for all of creation. We are bonded with creation and all within it, and all people, and all reality, because God is seeking to bring this redemption to all reality. We are bonded with it not because we are the saviors, but because we share a common savior. This is a community of solidarity with all of creation, one that expresses in its practices hope for a context in light of the horizon of expectation. God is bringing creation back into rhythm with his intended order. What God created, God is now recreating. So in the testimony of the, of the resurrection, we not only learn, but see and feel what has gone wrong is being put right. And again, this is a physicalized reality as well as a spiritual hope. This is a statement that says God is active in this world. If we say God created and then have no room for God in any kind of recreation or redemption of anything, then, then we're denying the very initial testimony. We can't say God created and then, then is just waiting for everything to go wrong. Why did God create? What did God create for? All of this goes into why God continues to love the world so much he sent his only son, and continues to love the world so much that he sends the Spirit to be a continued testimony. A continued testimony and continued act putting right what has gone wrong in an infinitely complex way. So the resurrection is for us a new identity, and this is the theme of the Christian life most particularly. I mean, we, we've talked about elements of this, but for us, the resurrection is the new identity. In the experience of Christ, the resurrection gathers all people into the power of the messianic movement even now. This messianic movement, this work of Christ working in this world and bringing new life and new power and new reality in a holistic way, works in the resurrection as Jesus was resurrected and initiates this movement even now continually as such people live in light of the Spirit's continued inbreaking of history. Only the love which passionately affirms life understands the relevance of this hope because it is through this that, that this love is liberated from the fear of death and the fear of losing its own self. What is losing one's own self? Again, if we're always anxious about the encroaching identity of others, we're losing ourselves. We don't have a firm sense of ourself. If we feel vulnerable and fragmented, we don't have a, a firm identity in ourself. We've lost one, our own self, really. If we're easily subverted, if we're easily distorted, if we're e easily pulled aside into ways that express false forms of meaning or purpose, or are just distractions pulling us away from what we're called to do, we don't really have our own self. And there are so many ways in which there's trying to define us. People always like to bring define other people and, and draw them in into their own false understandings of reality or their own distractions. Because the more people you can pull into your distractions or perversions or corruptions or whatever, the more safe you feel that this is actually right. And it just ends up being a whole crowd of anonymous non-people distracting themselves into death and distortion. So if you're easily subverted, you've lost your own self. And again, the orientation of the resurrection is that instead of losing ourself, instead of the fear of losing ourself, instead of the fear of death, and oriented our life around this fear of death so we're always anxious, concerned what's going to happen next, we have a love for life. And this love for life exceeds our fear of death. What does it mean to have a love for life? Think of that for a second. What does it mean to have a love for life? A love for life exceeds our fear of death. That is what the resurrection defines our new reality as. An early church writer named Ignatius said this, It is a part of a good athlete to be bruised and to prevail. When you're an athlete, you put up with a lot of suffering. I mean, few things cause as much bodily 
discomfort or bodily harm as as athletics pick a sport and in some way it's the whole sport goal is to break your body down and and so it's rebuilt to to interact with others and so you're you're forcing your way through something or forcing your way to something the best athletes are bro are bruised they're beaten in body but they push forward because those things aren't themselves the important thing they see the victory they see the goal and they'll put up with anything in order to get the goal to gain the victory to do what needs to be done it is the part of a good athlete to be bruised and to prevail a love for life exceeds the fear of death in expectation of the resurrection of the dead the person who hopes casts away the soul's protective cloak in which the wounded heart has wrapped itself so as not to let anything more come near we throw ourselves into this life and empty ourselves into the deadly realm of non-identity by virtue of the hope that God will find us in death and will raise us and gather us. We're willing to face non-identity. We're willing to face being dehumanized by the people who think they have the right to judge us or to validate us. Jesus was dehumanized. Jesus was thrown into the deadly realm of non-identity by the religious leaders by Rome on the cross. That deadly realm of non-identity is the starting place for Christian theology. That's the starting place for the Christian life. That's the testimony of baptism. And communion we don't need to be validated by the structures in this world by the power structures we don't need to find meaning in those other things because we say our ultimate meaning is in Jesus and that frees us to be the kind of people God wants us to be in our context the life that is filled with hopeful expectation with hope filled anticipation of the resurrection is the hope that allows us to go the way of non-identity in the structures of this world because we know that God will find us there we know that that is where Jesus is, that that is where we will find Jesus, and that God in finding us will raise us, in raising us will gather us together, and that we can be God's people being free and whole and transformative. The resurrection hope, Moltmann writes, makes people ready to live their lives in love wholly, and to say a full and entire yes to a life that leads to death. It does not withdraw the human soul from bodily sensory life. It ensouls this life with unending joy, and what does it mean to say a full and entire yes to a life that leads to death? That can be a tricky phrase. What we're saying is that life, this life, is going to end in our death. But that's not the end of the story. Do we live as if this is the death is the end of the story? Or do we live, even though this life will contain death, do we live in a way that says a full and absolute yes to life so that we know there is more to the story? This life that is filled with corruption and distractions can cause us anxiety and fear and if we say no to life we can experience death even now not having even a life always being battered or pulled down not ever really finding who god has made us to be always concerned about just the barest essence of life that's not a life of freedom so in saying a full entire yes to a life that leads to death we're saying a full entire yes to life to life as it is even though it may cause us harm, even though it may ultimately turn out to death in a temporary way, even if our yes to life causes distractions or suffering as we live in a way that other doesn't make sense to other people, we say a full and entire yes to all of life. Because in the light of the resurrection, the resurrection is this ultimate yes to life. Yes to this reality that life is more than just this temporary form of existence in which we struggle just to survive. We say a full and entire yes to a life that is defined by God's eternity, by defi defined by God's meaning and reality, that, it, that is this life that is defined by this resurrection. We want to be ensouled with unending joy. We don't want to withdraw. We want to be open and free, not closed off and trapped by the empty desires that lead only into more and more darkness. We want to say yes to that which brings life. We can say yes to death only in light of the resurrection hope. Death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? If we say that, we're no longer concerned about death. And so we no longer have to live in fear and anxiety about that which may bring us to death or may or just feel like death. Things that in which we're judged or we're... Or we're ourselves outcast or forsaken we don't have to worry about it anymore we can say yes to life because we know god is defining us in a new way 
We don't need to fear death. We don't need to be determined by false forms of identity that we think might protect us from death. Death no longer has the victory. Death is no longer our concern. Our concern is life and what leads to life and what leads and is expressed in this hope and promise. So a summary. The way of Jesus is the way of life. The way of Jesus is the way of hope. If we understand the resurrection and think of the end times as something to be afraid of or to be anxious about or to somehow cause us worry or harm, that's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is being open to others because we know our fullness is in God. The way of Jesus is being free in this life because we know that death no longer has a victory. The way of Jesus is transformative even now in this process of transition in which we are awakened to who we truly are because God has freed us to be the people he has always created us to be. And this does include death. The way of Jesus went through the way of death. And for us, the way of Jesus means that we have to let go false forms of identity. We have to die to ourselves. We have to let go trying to establish our own promises. And this often involves even being broken even more. The way of Jesus was one of death and descent, because the process of being taken out of the world's identity structures and taken away from the world's attempts to define us means oftentimes an initial place of isolation, of forsakenness, of death. But the way of Jesus says those aren't the end. Being outcast or forsaken or discouraged is not the end of the story. The way of Jesus brings life out of death descent. The promise of Jesus is one of life. And the way of Jesus, as we'll talk about next week, is also the way of ascent. We die to the world so that we can live in this world in the way God has called this whole world. And in calling this whole world and recreating this world, we say we are going to ascend to communion with God himself. So we are resurrected out of, and we are resurrected into, personal, personal and social forms of identity. We are resurrected out of the ways of sin, the ways of broken peace, the way of conflict. We are resurrected out of personal attempts to define ourselves and protect ourselves. Out of, we are resurrected out of our ego having to protect our, our, our self-understanding. And we're resurrected into a new form of being in which we are free to be who we truly are without having to be self-protective. We are resurrected into a new way of being social with others, involved, inviting, communal, rather than competing and trying to dominate. The way of identity and the way of community are transformed in light of the resurrection. It's a way of hope versus a way of fear, a way of light versus a way of darkness. This is a theme that was used a lot, especially in the earliest Christian communities, the Didache, which is a, a writing that was written about the time of the New Testament. It's not included in our New Testament for various reasons, but it, it reflects some of this very early idea, and they talked about the way of light versus the way of darkness. The resurrection is a way of life versus a way of death. If we believe in the resurrection, we are resurrected out of a way of death and resurrected into this way of life. That is the promise of God, the work of God, the way of Jesus, the power of the Spirit among us.